Well, it's, uh, I think it's the last day of winter. I think it's March 20th right now, um, Wednesday. And I'm taking another backpacking trip in Patrog. This one out to the Dowley Pond Shelter. I, this is just an overnight, one overnight. I wanted to uh, get out here, relax, do some fishing and stuff. There's um, a bass pond I've had in some of my other videos. I wanted to see if the bass are out yet, doing anything. My car's right back here, uh, maybe 100 yards up, and I'm hiking out there now. I'm not going to videotape the hike out there. Just uh, once I get out there and start getting set up, I'll probably turn it back on. And I wanted to um, make mention of one of my gear items, uh, kind of a negative review about it when I get out there. Now, I said I wasn't going to do any uh, videotaping on the walk down, but I figured I'd just show this and maybe one other thing. Uh, I, I was going to bring my M&P rifle for coyote hunting in case I came across anything. I didn't think they were going to be out here because usually they like to stick to the fields because they're more of a Midwest prairie kind of animal. But obviously they moved into the territory here in southern New England since the mid-50s or so. But there's a set of tracks from one right here going up the path. And the reason I know it's a coyote and not someone's dog is there's no people footprints going along the side of it. Back here where the the trail turned off this way towards the pond um, there wasn't any people footprints either it was just these heading out and heading into the woods there was a second set back there so it was a pair of them over here. Um, maybe next time I will bring my rifle out here just in case if I come across them. I'm looking to get one of the pelts Now we uh, we actually got like four inches of snow last night, and it's been such a warm day today that uh, most of it ended up melting. You can see back that way in the woods, there's still probably about an inch and a half, two inches still on the ground over there. Up here with the sun hitting, because it is the last day of winter, um, it's gone. Now the survival books always tell you, when you come across a resource, you should grab it while you see it. And this is one of them right here. It's just all around. I took uh, a bunch of it. It's just tall dead grass. And uh, I'm going to use it to get my fire started later on. Because there won't be any of this over at the shelter. So might as well grab it now while I see it. Well, there's the shelter. I'll probably have to go over and start off by remaking the fireplace and getting rid of any beer bottles, that kind of stuff that might be in there. Looks like some people stack some wood and stuff up there, so I'll go check that out. Alright, so I made it. Um, actually, this is the best condition I've seen this place since I have been coming down here. People actually left a pile of wood over there. Uh, these stumps over here, there's two of them. That one one over there and uh, they make nice nice seats for in front of the fire and ironically there's no uh, there's no beer bottles shoved in it or anything broken glass anywhere someone was trying to rough it or uh, practice their survival skills or something I found I found this laying off on the side here just standing up what they had done I've seen this before they took they took uh, like 50 pound uh, paracord, something like that, and tied it around the top of it. So what they do, they make a teepee out of it. When you you twist one of them around and it cinches the knots tighter, and when, and as you spread it out, it makes a really strong frame. And then looks like they were piling on these uh, pine boughs right here. So they probably set that up somewhere over here, and uh, just to see if they they could, I guess, because. I mean, obviously, there's no need for it. You got a shelter right here, but they were probably just practicing their survival skills or whatever. Yeah, so this is it. I'm psyched about the wood. I'm going to try and split it up a little better, though. Maybe, uh, maybe saw some of those pieces in half because I have my BioLite stove. I'll show that again. I've showed it uh, on Mount Musalaki. I had to send it back to get refurbished 
or uh, replaced. They they took mine and they gave me a brand new one uh, because there was something going on with the power head. It did its cooking job fine. It cooked food fine. The fan came on fine to to power the um, combustion chamber, but there was an issue with the charging port. It would tr it would take like a roaring fire to get the thing to turn on to start charging an accessory after a while. That was after maybe I don't know four uses, and three of them were uh, three of them were actually uh, practical, like out in the field, and one of them was just a, a bench test. So really quick, it that ended up happening. <clears throat> All right, first things first, um, I have a nice set of Ray-Ban sunglasses I usually bring um, most places, day hikes and stuff, not when I'm backpacking, I don't like to bring them, I have in the past, but um, they cost too much to bring out here and bust by accident, and because of all the, because of all the snow out there, I'm getting the snow glare, so one substitute for that, you see it on football players all the time, take a piece of charcoal, and just blacken under your eyes because that's what happens most of the time light reflects I brought a uh, emergency uh, mirror that you you flash for airplanes and stuff I use it for this kind of stuff if you if you get splinters or something in your eye you can you can get it out But this cuts down on the glare an awful lot. There. Alright. That's on there. I wish it was darker. I'm going to get some better charcoal later on. And This is just what was in the fireplace from the last person. If you get it burned down pretty good, you can usually... Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Alright, yeah, that definitely makes a difference. Now another thing I have here, I bring all the time when I'm out backpacking, is a uh, collapsible shovel. Just locks into the handle like that. This is the perfect thing to uh, get yourself situated for digging out a fire pit or something. Especially when the stuff like today, where the the ground's all wet, the place you're going to have it is all wet. I'm actually going to put that flat rock down, this one, right here in this area to make a hearth out of it. I'll tell you, uh, thank you to whoever left that wood here because that's going to save me a lot of foraging. Uh, I was gonna start off with that right off the bat after I got this made getting wood whatever I found that was dry stuff off the ground below the canopy but because of that I don't have to I'll just use my little uh, Fol Felco folding saw and zip that up into more manageable pieces for myself There was a couple of flat rocks I had here last time. I used the same ones over and over like this. I'm probably going to swap that out and this one out of the way.
this is going to be my only little area right there. I'm going to have the fire right in here and then just have it radiate and heat back on me. I mean, if you use the whole fire pit that they have here, you, you go through that pile of wood in probably 15 minutes. So, <clears throat> that. Here's that folding saw. I've shown it in just about all my videos that I'm doing any anything like this. It's a, uh, a Felco 600, if you can see that. And this thing eats through wood like nothing. You can see the serrated edge there. I'll use it on that stuff back there at some point later. <clears throat> I also brought a, uh, a compact fish and tackle box. It's just got some lures and stuff, hooks, weights. I'll probably end up just using the lures. My favorite one's the, the cast master that's on here. This is a South Bend uh, telescopic fishing pole. I like it because it packs away real easy. This is a little Fluger fishing reel I have on it, ultralight. I could probably use some more string on the spool, but that's what I got. I, I've had to cut it so many times. It, it doesn't. I just keep forgetting. I keep forgetting to go ahead and refill it again. I mean, it works fine. These things are great. You can't get them in stores, or they're. I mean, I've never been to a store that has them. I got this online. It was either Amazon or Google Shopping or something. But yeah, it's a, it's a South Bend. If you just typed in South Bend telescopic fishing pole, this this should come up pretty quick. But it's a, it's a nice little set to, to bring along. I'll use this stuff at the pond later on. <clears throat> I got my uh, my SOG seal. I use this one to, uh, to split the wood. I use it for all kinds of stuff, but that's one of the things I use it for when I'm wood gathering. And... This is the one thing I said I had a negative review about. A lot of people already know what this is. It's a, it's a Camelback water bladder. This one I think holds two liters, three liters. It holds three liters. Um, I got it as a replacement for a platypus one that I've had. Um, it, it's called the Hoser, the platypus one. That one I had, still have for years, and I've never had a problem with it. Only thing is the uh, the mouthpiece needed to be uh, replaced once, and that was it. It's just this little small rubber part here it comes off. Another one goes on, and uh, but I, I, you know, obviously seen the advertising and stuff for for these, so I wanted to give it a try. I'll tell you what, these are more hype than than advertising than than they are actually quality equipment. If you can see the water there. All over my hands. If you can hear this. See that? See that? That's water coming right out the bottom of this thing. I've used this. Literally, this is my third time using this. This thing was brand new. And I've used it two other times, and it's already shooting water everywhere. I had a little mishap when I was packing the stuff in the car. I took this, I got all my other stuff in, then I slid this water bladder in there. And as I was sliding it in, water was coming out all around the seal. And there's only one way to put it on. This little cap spins here. You can see where you start it. There's a little uh, silver thing here. Yeah, right there. You... you, you put the cap on right there, line up that little arrow right there with this spot, and then turn it till it points to that dot. And, uh, yeah, there's the dot. <laughs> yeah, so that's all it takes. There, twist, and it's supposed to be locked, and watertight, and guess what? It's not watertight. This thing's a piece of junk. I will never buy another one of these. My platypus one, the whole thing's one sealed uh, unit and then down here where the tube latches on is a threaded part like a, a water bottle uh, cap 
and you just tighten that up and there's no issues it, it never leaks this one right here you just saw I squeezed it water poured out the bottom it's set to lock it's as tight as it can possibly go it can't go any tighter things a piece of junk don't ever buy one Now this is one of my favorite tents. It's my Eureka High Camp tent. It's a four season tent. It's got a, a small footprint so you can you can get it in smaller spaces than my other one which was the um, Eureka K2. This is uh, I think a two person tent. They categorize it as a two person. I think it's more like one and a half. You could fit two people in but not with the gear. The vestibule you could put some of the gear in I guess. It's got two of them, one on the front, one on the back. The front one is bigger than the back one. I was going to set this up inside the shelter here, but turns out this shelter here at Dowley Pond is actually smaller than the shelter that's at Peg Mill, which is down by Green Falls in the Patchogue Forest here. Uh, I was able to set that up with room to spare, put the, the rain fly on it, and stretch the vestibules out in the Peg Mill shelter. This one, I could barely fit the uh, the high camp in there with it wouldn't have done anything with the rain fly on it and I got to have the rain fly on this time of year to uh, to keep the heat in because uh, it's gonna get down to I think 21 tonight 21 degrees so yeah this is this is another one that's really easy to set up get your aluminum stakes they uh, cut down on weight as opposed to the steel ones that you can get. ground here is nice and soft. I'm able to just push these things in. Some places you're beating them with a rock just to get them in. footprint for this is actually just a tarp that I cut down to the right size of the bottom of it. It, it saves you a, a ton of money. The footprints for these things go for ridiculous amounts. I mean, I think it's over $100 for just the footprint, and all that is is something to keep the tent off from the ground. So a tarp, it's waterproof. It does just as good. You just buy one for whatever, 10 bucks at Job Lot and, or some other store, and you can uh, cut it to the size you need it. They're not that heavy. on these things are pretty nice too. They're color coded. The gold ones, those ones go for the tent and the, I guess, orange one, that one is for the, the vestibule. So it's easy to, to get it set up and not get them confused. The thing I like about this tent is there isn't any uh, sleeves to slide the poles through. You just have to clip them on with these plastic carabiners that it comes with. It just makes it much easier for setup in bad weather and stuff.
two of these poles, uh, the gold ones I mean, they're, they're perfectly straight and then two more have a bend built into them. That bend, uh, you'll see where that goes, that's to help hold the vestibule out. The straight ones make an X across the middle, corner to corner, diagonally, corner to corner, and then you, uh, you clip the middle of the tent off. That holds the main frame of the tent. Once you get this cross part done, just find the middle of the tent here and then clip it on. And then you can start clipping the other ones around it. Okay, now there's two side supports, <clears throat> excuse me, along the side of the tent here that get staked down. That's where the two gold poles with the bend in the middle go. From the far, far side there across the front, farther side over here across the back. Again, these plastic carabiners hold everything into place. So, and you can see this isn't going anywhere.
Okay, so that's the uh, that's the tent part itself set up. As you can see, everything nice and easy, just clips right together. Here's the front, and it's got these these shorter clips here that keep everything nice and taut. Like that. These are the side ones I was talking about. You can see how they crisscross with the uh, the bent poles here. They crisscross each other so that they pull out on the sides nice. And the reason that this kind of a setup is really nice, especially for um, colder weather and stuff, the rainfly doesn't actually sit on the tent. It's got probably about a three inch space there between where the rain fly is going to sit and uh, and where the tent is so that doesn't let any condensation that builds up on the rain fly it doesn't get in the tent it just runs down the rain fly on the inside if it even gets in and then the rain fly just goes over the top of this I just got to figure out what size is the front. All right, that's the back. On the inside of the rainfly, also, it has um, Velcro that you can use to, to zip up the, the aluminum poles to, to hold it on even tighter for bad weather. I almost never use them and I've never had a problem, but they're there just in case you need to. Then there's these nylon clips too, just go around the corners. Again, helps in bad weather. All you have to do is clip the thing in just to hold it in place for the beginning and then you can start you can start using the the poles. Now the nice thing about these two, these tie downs here, they, uh, they're held on a ring so you can position this any way you need to if you have obstructions in your way like large trees or anything. You can just run it over to whatever point you want to and stake it down that way. I'm probably not going to use them tonight, I don't think it's going to be windy, but you can. Again it's more added support.
All right, and that's it, right there. That's the uh, the Eureka High Camp. Nice tent. I've taken it up to Mount Washington. Um, I've taken it Mount Musalaki, other places in the in the White Mountains, the Kinsman Ridge Trail, and this thing's tried and tested. It it never has a problem. It's always waterproof. Like I said, I've had it for years. It's probably my maybe my fourth year third year with this tent and I've got no complaints it, it works exactly as advertised and it, it's perfect it keeps you dry keeps the wind out I've even cooked in this vestibule before with my uh, with my gas stove I can't use my bio light stove in it because that makes an actual big fire that comes out the combustion chamber which is the one I brought this time so I could charge this phone when the battery dies or it gets too low but with uh, with a collapsible camping stove I mean, when I was up on the Kinsman Ridge Trail, I was cooking right in there, keeping the weather out, and it actually warmed up the thing a bit, too, but it was perfect. Boiling water, making mountain house meals, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so that's that. Let's see if you can see that there. I don't know if it's going to show up on the camera. This whole area on my uh, sleeping bag is wet. Right here and then all over here. This was thanks to that junk camelback that I got. When the thing poured in, it poured down and got everything all wet. I'm gonna put it in the tent, let it air dry out in the tent for a while. It is made of a synthetic. It's a Eastern Mountain Sports Pack rated to negative 15. Uh, I mean sleeping bag. But well, hopefully it'll dry off. I, I just that pisses me off because it's cold out. It's going to be colder tonight, and uh, to have something like that happen is, is just unacceptable. Uh, next time it's going to be my platypus I bring with me for a water bladder. I'll, I'll just leave that one at home for day day hikes or something. Well, I'm uh, I'm all done cutting up what wood I'm going to cut up for now. That's it right here. Ugh. This is the stuff I'm going to put in my uh, my BioLite stove, just small pieces. It's oak, so my Felco saw took a little bit, but it got through it fine, and then I split it again with the SOG. I'm going to go do some fishing now, and then uh, when I get back, when I get back from fishing, I'll make some food. So we'll see how that goes. I might even bring one back, we'll see. Because it's uh, late winter and because of all the snow melt, this is the, the trail. That's where I came. You can see there's big puddles all across it. But I have to cross a little brook here now to get to the other side. The, the fishing pond I, I go to is, is up the hill there. And I mean, I'm not worried about the water. These are actually, see these down here. These are. Loa Zephyr boots, they're midsole boots, they they come about up past your ankles, but they're Gore-Tex, so I can just walk right through this and my feet don't get wet. That's another good thing, if you're going to do hiking and stuff, get a nice set of boots, don't, don't get something that's cheap, it'll fall apart on you, and... Also, break them in before you before you go out on your first hike. Wear them for day hikes or that kind of stuff. I mean, backpacking. When you're going backpacking, don't wear them out brand new out of the box. You got to let them fit to your foot. But once you do, yeah, they make all the difference. This is my second pair of these boots that I've owned. The other ones I had for years, and they never let me down. They just the soles. I almost wore them flat, but they're great for climbing rocks. They're Good for all my mountain hikes up in New Hampshire. They get a pretty good grip even on wet and slippery uh, surfaces. I'm out here. Uh, this is usually where I set up at. It's just a drainage culvert that takes it, the water down on the other side of the road here. And then there's a stream. In the right times of year, you can you can catch frogs and stuff down there and use them for bait on this side. 
See, one of my favorite things about the winter backpacking is, besides dropping the pack off at base camp when I get there, is uh, I have all this to me. This is all mine. No one around. The only tracks that were out here, two people had walked their dogs down and back uh, up the road, and that was it. The rest of it was untouched. There wasn't even anything in the in the snow. But so I'm going to give it a shot out here, see if I have any luck or not. Tell you what, those are some odd shaped tracks right there. I wonder what kind of animal they go to. Here's here's a perspective for you. There's my foot, and there's the bird. I think it's a bird. It must be a really big bird, because its foot's about half the size of mine. And they go off this way. You can see they're walking off into the woods over there. Right up towards the pond. Huh. If anyone out there has any guesses as to what that is, let me know. I'm kind of curious. Oh man, I'm back at the shelter now. It's getting a little later in the day. I think it's probably close to two hours of daylight left. Check out the view of what I got going right here. This is the Great Meadow Pond. Right now out there I'm hearing I'm hearing geese, Canadian geese, ducks, uh, I'm seeing all kinds of signs of animals. Snowshoe or not snowshoe hair, uh, cottontail, rabbits, um, coyotes like I pointed out before, that weird bird track that I saw back there. There's all kinds of stuff out here except for people, which is great. This is the whole reason I come out here and do this. I actually I work in the IT field and I love my job I love what I do I, I like helping people but sometimes you just need to unplug it gets it gets to a point where too much going on so this is my way to recharge my batteries and center myself again I got my biolite stove out here <coughs> That's it right there. You can see that. Got the glare coming off it. Yeah, there it is. This is the this is the charging port. This is the part on my last one that wasn't working right. And uh, I have to say, BioLate's customer service, the customer support, is top notch. They there was no questions asked. They had my purchase on file and they just sent me out a new one before I even sent this one back or the broken one back so I got this one in the mail and mine was still on its way back to to their factory to to get checked out to figure out what went wrong with it and this is going to be the first time I'm using this one this new one so hopefully everything's top notch with it and I had to, one thing about this stove, um, the, the collapsible white gas fuel stoves, you can use a, a smaller pot to, to boil the water. With this one, because it's got such a, a wide combustion chamber on the top here, I had to buy one of these Primus, it's um, anodized aluminum, and it's one of the only ones that's a really high quality one, really lightweight. And it fits on the top of this just fine. It, it works great. It's a nice combination. And when I did the math, it turned out this BioLite stove with that pot and the measuring cup actually weighed less than my white gas can full with my stove and the uh, aluminum set I had for that, that was an Optimus Solo set. 
Uh, so I actually shaved off a little bit of weight from from using this one. Plus, the the thing that they advertise most is it it charges your accessories. So after uh, I'm I'm going to charge this iPhone with it while I'm cooking on it in a little bit. I got my my Mountain House meals here. This is one of the ones. I got another one for the morning. So I'll get this thing cranking, and then when I when I do, I'll turn that back on. Well, I just realized something when I went to go set everything up to get this going and charge my phone. I did forget something. I forgot the charging adapter for my phone. So I mean, my battery's still at like 75%. But I can show you how to get this thing going, and uh, I mean, the rest is just plug the charger in there, plug it into the phone, and it starts charging. There'll be a green light that comes on right there. That'll be a green LED that comes across this part right here, and that means it's ready to charge. So let me get this thing going right now. I got my oak pieces that I cut up earlier. Right there. Smaller stuff to get it started. It comes with the stove here, it comes with little fire starter pieces. They're not a necessity, they make things easier though. Uh, normally, I mean, once the, these run out, because obviously they're finite. You just use grass, use paper, whatever it takes to, to get it started to begin with. So you can see here. You get that going. Slide it down. It's in there. Let's start putting these in right in the front here you can see that there's a light that turns the fan on. The fan is in there blowing the air around onto the wood. So then you just start loading your pieces of wood in. Now this looks like this looks like it's going to actually light up easier than it does sometimes. Right now, I was able to get pretty dry stuff. I lucked out. There's a copper probe inside on the end of this. This whole piece comes off, goes inside, and then you store it away. But that copper probe is a uh, thermal conductor. It takes the heat energy converts it to electricity and then you can charge your accessories from it. Now this thing advertises as, as a clean burn, smokeless. When you're getting it started it definitely smokes as you can see right here. But once it gets going you can take your, your pot, put it on top as far as the actual the actual stove aspect, it boils water great. Uh, my white gas stoves don't boil water as quick as this does. This this takes about two and a half minutes once it's actually going to boil water, and those white gas stoves take me closer to four and a half or five minutes to to boil the same amount of water. This is two cups in here. That's what you use. Whoops. That's what it takes for the mountain house meals. They take two cups of water, depending on the ones you get. Some are less, like the um, the scrambled eggs for the in the morning time that they have. Those ones are less, but 
I think that's a cup and a half. But all the for the most part, the rest of them are about two cups. And then right now, you'll see the flame will start shooting out the top here, and then when it does, the smoke will go away. And then all you have to do is add your sticks to it. The nice thing about this is, the fuel for it, it's all around you. I'm big into the uh, off-the-grid, energy-efficient, uh, self-sustaining items that, that, that are out there. Even um, on the, the home front, like you could have this thing at your house, and if you lose power, you can still charge your phone, you can still charge batteries if you have rechargeable batteries for flashlights and things. I'm going to let this thing cook. I might have overloaded this thing too. There it goes. Once it starts going, it is right, the smoke goes away. But getting it to that point, it's definitely smoky. But you'll see, now that it's actually going, I could time it in the... Uh, The burn time it takes to boil this water will not be very much. It was almost consistently two and a half minutes with the uh, other four times that I used it.
It really doesn't take much wood either once it gets going. I mean, I used probably about that much for what's in there now. Maybe a little bit more, maybe another couple pieces, but yeah, I have that whole pile over there behind it, and then all this. And the water's, uh, look at it, it's already steaming. The nice thing about this oak is, it takes a while to burn, so you don't have to keep reloading this all the time. See that right there? There's that green LED. This means that right now, if I had had this thing plugged into that phone, it would be charging it. This one, uh, the the one that says this, I don't know if you can see that. Right here says low and high. That's for the fan setting. Under it, there's that bar. That bar turns green. And when that happens, that's when it charges. And this is already boiling. It's not a rolling boil yet, but. Now it's a rolling boil. See if you can see that in there. It's kind of tough with all the steam, but yeah, that's boiling. There's my meal. Here's the water. So as you can see though, that's very little wood that it took to boil that. And it's still going. I could boil another bunch of water in this thing. And this one's still got the charging light on over here. Just keep dropping pieces of wood in there. See? There's the combustion chamber. It's got holes in it, and then the fan spirals the uh, the air. That's why you can see there's almost a cyclone action with the with the flames. Yeah, biolite stove. So there's the real deal. It does make smoke, but it does what it's supposed to. It cooks your food, boils your water, and it charges your accessories. Last time I had this thing on Mount Musilaki, I that's up in New Hampshire, by the way. I um, was able to get my phone 30% charged in just under an hour. And that was with pine and stuff. This oak probably would have went even longer. So I'm just going to stir the water into this and then let it sit.
And then I'm ready to put the feed bag on. Well, it's still going. The stuff's almost burned down in it. But as you can see on this one, the charging light is, uh, is still on. So this would still be charging the phone, even though there's almost no wood left in it. I want to um, take an aside here for a minute to apologize to any people who like watching my YouTube channels on a regular basis and see what see what I'm putting up here because uh, I've been at home working on an outbuilding on my property just something up off the ground for my my little kid to to hang out and when he gets a little older and that's been taking up most of my time so I haven't had much time to get out and do these videos and do the hikes and stuff so yeah that that's the reason why but this one will be up here soon enough well here's another example of uh my haste causing a problem for me I was so ready to get out the door this morning I just grabbed this thing and uh, I thought it still had somewhat of a candle in it maybe half or a third or something it has about that much of a candle left in it these things take nine hour candles it's a Yuko lantern that's it right there it's telescopic so once you get the candle lit you have this open first, you light the candle, the candle's in there. And then it has this this spring. The spring goes up in here and the bottom locks on. Sorry, I got a lot of wax in here. Alright, right there. So that spring puts tension on the bottom plate and the candle, and it forces the candle up as it burns. Well, the window to see how much candle you got left only goes to there, so I assume there was about that much candle left, right above the, the marker there. And when I just pulled it out to look at it, I found out there's only that much candle. So, I'm going to use it with how I can, but that way you can see. Like, um, there's a guy who does survival, his name's Cody Lundin, and he's on that show Dual Survival on Discovery Channel. And his thing is, you need you should have at least four ways to make fire if you're going out any kind of backpacking or day hiking or anything well my thing is you should have at least two or three ways to make light too after dark one of them obviously being a fire I got the fire place over there I showed you guys earlier this was my second way and I have uh, I have this over here Ugh. It's a Princeton Tech headlamp. I think Cabela's and a couple other places make an identical one to this, so it's probably uh, the patent ran out on it. But this one works great. Um, let's see. doesn't say the model on it but I guess it's waterproof up to a meter, so you could drop it in the water. It's got a, a gasket on it. Right there. This whole edge, that's all a gasket. And I got... I got these. Energizer Advanced Lithium. And these are brand new batteries, so this will last me the whole trip easily. I could go days with this thing, the way it is. And it's got this screw on the back to tighten it up to make sure it's waterproof. So I'll probably be using this most of the night, but I like this one too because it's, I mean, a nine-hour candle and batteries are batteries. They get cold, they don't work as good, they... 
you know, just the nature of batteries, they they aren't the greatest thing in the world. We don't have good battery technology as a technology nowadays. Lithium is right up there, but these candles right here, this was just a paraffin wax candle. They sell beeswax ones for the same thing, and the beeswax ones are actually better. They're a lot more expensive, but they burn a lot longer. So if you got those. But I, I'll light this up with what's left of it and show you. I mean, obviously it's only one candle power, but one candle power is brighter than you might think. When you hang it up, it's got, you can see on the, the top here, when it's open... It has this chain with this hook. You can hang it on a nail or something on a tree branch if you're really roughing it. And, uh, yeah, it puts out a lot of light. I mean, you can see what you need to do, uh, no problem. But I like it. For what it weighs, it's not very much. This is all aluminum. That's aluminum. Actually, the whole thing, this is all aluminum. The only thing that isn't the, uh, the spring is steel, but it's so skinny that it doesn't matter. It doesn't weigh you down or anything. And they sell a... Here we go. They sell a neoprene pack for it so you don't bust it. That's it right there. So the whole thing just goes together, closes up. But that's how you put the candles in. You unscrew the bottom here, pull it off. Push the plate down, put the, oh, sorry, I said battery, the candle, put the new candle in, and then um, slip the thing up in the bottom, lock it, and then you can close it down, put it in the case. So, that's another nice thing to have when you're backpacking, because they do last a long time, and if you think about it, when you're out there and it's after dark, you're probably only using light from you know, dark for another hour and a half, two and a half hours, something like that. So a nine hour candle, I mean, that'll get you one, two, three, four, probably four days, maybe five, depending on how much you use it. If you're only doing an hour and a half, it's going to get you more. But it's totally worth it. You can see everything you need to do. You can make food by it. I was a little careless with this one. You can see the, this is the glass globe that goes inside of it. I got wax all inside, so I'll get that off of there. But when the time comes, I'll show you that, all my nighttime stuff. The headlamp, it's pretty bright, this. Let's see if you can see the ducks right out there. Maybe not, but... They're not very far out there. Actually, looking this way, no, no, they keep going. <laughs> There's actually four of them. They're just doing their own thing. Pretty cool. I got the campfire going in. All the ducks started moving away. <clears throat> They're all on the other side of the pond now. I can hear a turkey out there too behind me. Was gonna cut this long log in half and then put it in there on two halves, but I'm too tired. So I'm just going to burn it in half and then take the two halves after that. It's coming up on dusk now. The sun's behind me. It's starting to set. I'll give it another 15-20 minutes then it's dark. And then I'll show you my other stuff. I'll get the, the light going and the lantern. You can still see, but the sun is definitely set. That's what it looks like out in front of me. 
it's a little bit brighter than that right now. I spared you the part of me warming my feet by the fire. <laughs> Yeah, you can't even see in here now. I could see all my stuff pretty good, but tell you what, this darkness doesn't make good for filming. <clears throat> oh man, I'm tired. I've had a long couple of days. I've been off from work for a bit, but it's all been building. That outbuilding that I was talking about. Well, I wanted to show you my lantern, but it's about had it. It's going to go out right now. I lit it about five minutes ago. Well, that's not much of a show. Oh well. But this is my Princeton Tech headlamp. At least with it, you can see everything. That Yuko lantern is nice when it's got a full uh, candle in it. <laughs> Unfortunately, right now it doesn't, so. That's what I'm left with. As a matter of fact, I think it went out. Got this thing going. Tell you what, I have a tough time with the uh, nighttime filming. I mean, because you can't carry, like, a Coleman lantern out here with you. This works all right, but you can probably hear all the geese on that microphone there. They're all over this pond. If I was a waterfowl hunter, I'd be in heaven right now. funny, even when you're out here unplugging, you still got the airplanes flying overhead. I don't know if you can hear that on the microphone or not, but they're up there. We've seen about three in the last 15, 20 minutes, something like that. They must all be taken off from somewhere at the same time. There's a half moon out right now that's bright enough to, well, not see on the camera, but it's making shadows. There's a doe in behind me, behind the shelter, a ways back, calling. You can probably hear it, listen. There it is. There it goes again. It's been calling out for the last five minutes or so. Oh, morning everyone. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool right now. Uh, it must be pretty early. I didn't look at the time on my phone yet. I got the fire going. 
this blue sky all above me. Sun's just rising over there. And there's uh, snow flurries going on. I have no idea where they're coming from. Because I don't see any clouds anywhere. <laughs> really cool. If you could see. Probably not on the camera. Mm. It got really cold last night. Not, I mean, it, it, I've been out in colder. It, it was probably about... 22, 23 degrees out. My bag was fine. I was warm in it. I used my jacket as a pillow so I don't have to carry as much. Had the. This is an Oraj balaclava. Let's see, that's their symbol there. You can't even get this, I don't think, anymore. It came with my uh, Oraj Alaskan jacket, which was probably a 2005 model. I don't think they make them in their jackets anymore. It used to ball up and then zip into the back of the jacket. That one got beat up and I don't have it anymore. But this one right here I use it with. This is another one, same thing, Oraz jacket. These things are Gore-Tex. Nice coat, expensive. I think it was about, it's about $400 or something, but they work great. They keep you warm. They've got pockets everywhere. It's one of the, I mean, I, I will never buy another type of jacket besides this one. I'm going to get that stove going in a little bit and make breakfast. Another mountain house meal. And I brought a, it's a little package. You can buy a Propel fitness water package and you just dump it in like 16 ounces of water. Shake it up. Really good, adds electrolytes and all that. Whatever you're using out here from hiking and stuff. So, I found the perfect size bottle. It's not a standard bottle. I think I got it from Job Lot or something with some kind of flavored water or something. I have two of them, I saved the bottles. But these things are just the right size. You dump one packet in and it's exactly the right amount, so there's no measuring or anything. So that's going to be breakfast. Well, here it goes again. It's, uh, it's roaring. It was actually, <clears throat> excuse me, it was still smoky at the beginning, getting it started, but now that it's going, uh, you can see there's no smoke. Uh, it, it was a little quicker than getting it going last night. As a matter of fact, I think, no, the water's not boiled yet. I just got it on there. And it looks like with this thing, less is more. Having, not having a stuffed combustion chamber seems to work better than piling the wood in as much as you can. This time I got a rice and, it's a rice pilaf. It's got vegetables and mushrooms and stuff in it comes with a little Parmesan cheese packet. <laughs> Campfire still going out there. This is about the end of it for this too. When, uh, when this burns down, I'm going to finish packing up my stuff. I got most of it. The tent's already in the pack. The um, sleeping bag, the, the thermal rest pad, everything except the tarp and the stove so far. And I'm actually going to bring some of this wood back with me, back home. The, uh, the oak I've been finding, that someone left here, and this piece too. This is just such hard wood, it works great for this stove, so I think I'll just take it home. And if I do any, if I do any backpacking in the... Or uh, sorry, camping in the in the back of my property. I got five acres on a state forest, so that outbuilding that I'm building, this would be a good stove for that to cook food in and stuff. But I could just leave that somewhere in that 
in that outbuilding and have it ready to go. Even for getting the fire pit, I actually have I have my, my outbuilding I'm building that's all the way up to the roof right now. I got the rafters up. I haven't put the, the plywood up yet. But um, right outside of that, there's, there's a camping area that's probably this whole circle you see in front of you right here up to the trees there. And I have a fire pit in there. So I could probably leave some of that wood in, in that outbuilding for uh, for that too. If I want to get a fire started, it's been raining or something, I can just grab a grab a couple of those and get it going, dry out the other wood. You can see there though again, the uh, the charging light is still going on this. So this and actually there's not very much left in that combustion chamber, but it's enough to to keep the charging aspect going and the fan. I know you hear me talk about these mountain house meals all the time. You always see me eating them. Um, only thing about them is they're really pricey for what they are. Uh, it's the technology they take that it takes to to make them. The freeze drying process is really expensive, so the meals cost a lot. But they have a shelf life of something like 30 years. If if I ever was in a situation where I could buy in bulk, I, I would love to drop a grand or something on on those and just have a whole pantry full of them just to have because I, I mean I'm not gonna stop backpacking so I can always use them they'll eventually get used up I just obviously you know how the economy is nowadays there's no no extra thousand dollars in my pocket so that ain't happening is a nice thought though so my stove cooled down here um, here's what I was saying about how it comes apart That's the combustion chamber. On the bottom here, these legs, they just fold in. This last leg here, the one in the middle, actually holds the uh, thermal conductor in place. And you have to keep that probe pretty clean too. I mean that's not bad. It, it, another good thing to bring with this is a uh, like a scotch bright pad so you can clean that off periodically depending on how long you're going out but it just fits in there and then it's got its own stuff sack for it pretty simple and that's the stove so I mean if, if you took this and put it beside um, one of those collapsible white gas stoves say that's about that big, the canister for it, about that. I mean, that's a lot more bulk in your bag and uh, the weight with everything filled up. But that's it. Violate stove. I like this thing. Mainly because it's it, it charges. That's, that's my big selling point. And it really does boil water very fast. If I can, I mean, there's been times I've been budgeting my, my weight gas when I was out with this. You don't have to. You just throw wood in it go around, pick up sticks, break them off branches or whatever, and then throw them in.